With breathtaking speed, drug makers created new vaccines to combat COVID-19. Two have been approved in the United States, and there are several more still in development. For many people, however, the rollout of the vaccines has been a source of confusion and frustration. Some vaccination sites have too few doses, and other sites have been forced to throw out usable vaccines. Where are we with the distribution of vaccines in the United States and around the world? What's known about the new variants of the coronavirus? And what might the next 12 months of the pandemic look like? Welcome to the New Ideal podcast. I'm Ilan Jerno. Joining me today is Dr. Amish Adalja, an expert on infectious diseases. He's also a scholar uh, at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Amish, welcome back. It's good to have you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to start with just to get a, a read on your understanding of where things are with the distribution, because I think that there's been a lot of stories I've been following. And one of the things that struck me is that we've seen the vaccines in development for months now, and there was a, 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 sort of a long lead time for when they would, or seemingly long lead time. But there hasn't been a, it doesn't seem like there's been a kind of level of urgency or a kind of a war footing or ramping up that I would have expected. And so we've heard that Joe Biden promised 1 million vaccines a week, then it was 1.5. And now the latest I heard was everyone will have the opportunity to get one by the end of July. So what do you think that target number should actually be per day? How would you, what would it look like and what do you, how do we get there? So we have been slowly increasing from less than a million doses per day to 1 million to 1.5 to 2 million. And now I think we're, we're likely to go faster as we get further along. I don't really think there should be a number. It should be as quickly as possible. There should be no speed limit. But if we are to put this pandemic behind us, if we're to get the benefits of this vaccine as quickly as possible, we really have to pull all the stops out and be on a war footing. As you said, this has to be the number one priority for, for our, our state and federal government to get vaccine because they've basically taken over the distribution process and they're faltering at it. And some of this is understandable because we did go through this whole summer telling people we need vaccine infrastructure because state health departments are not gonna be able to do this because they have to set up testing sites, they have to do contact tracings and they're underfunded, undervalued. And no one has ever really put any priority on fixing these chronic problems with our health departments. And, and that was something that was predictable because they just kind of Put, kept kicking the can down the road and we only got funding over Christmas weekend is when President Trump signed, signed the funding for this. So you already had started a vaccine program without the funding to do so. And it's exactly what happened during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Most people don't remember that, but that vaccine rollout, again, managed by the federal and state governments, very badly botched in terms of predictability, understanding when vaccine was coming, how much and where. And the stakes are so much higher with COVID-19 than they were with 2009 H1N1. So it's really another example of just people not really understanding what the implications were and, and taking the making the correct decisions early on. And then we're kind of scrambling now where we, we can't get enough vaccine into people's arms quick enough. And those target dates of when people are going to get vaccine be available to, general, to the general public keeps getting pushed down because we're really worried about the ability to actually deliver vaccine. So I want to understand some of the constraints that, that are in place. So you mentioned the, the state and federal governments botching different elements of this and, and the, the coordination. There seems to be also the question of um, who is, who's qualified to inject people with, a va with, with the syringe. And so if there are not enough people working at these stations, that would seem to be one kind of constraint. Is, there, is it the case that um, only doctors and nurses are able to do that kind of thing? No, there, there are expanded practice uh, profiles for some, some other uh, health workers. So for example, pharmacists can do this, but a pharmacist has to, at least in my state of Pennsylvania, they have to go online, they have to pay money, they have to take a course to be able to do that. We also have paramedics, emergency medical technicians, we can use dentists uh, as well. Uh, I, I've been someone that's advocated anybody that has the training or can be trained should be doing it, including veterinarians when we were in this mass vaccination type of mode where we're just kind of lining people up and vaccinating them. We haven't quite got there because there's so much constraint that we, now the problem is having kind of predictability of when a vaccine site is getting doses and how many doses they're getting. But I do think in general, people have recognized the need to have as many vaccinators as possible. But right now, the, the biggest problem is just the scheduling and, and having the predictability of doses coming from the federal government to the state government, and then getting to the, the actual person who's going to do the vaccination. 
but it, th these are all important things that we have to have lined up in order to, to go through this as quickly as possible. And it's not really happening very well. So you mentioned the, the supply and I've been reading that the manufacturers have been able to ramp up production to the point where they're, they're pre delivering vaccines, but the, the bottleneck or one of them seems to be uh, getting it for, once it's delivered to the government of whatever level, then going to the local sites of the last mile to actually getting to people. And you mentioned as well, the, I mean, is that your, have you seen that too? Is that one of the bottlenecks? Definitely. I think it is the last mile. Operation Warp Speed was a success for what it was designed to do, develop vaccines. And just, I have some props here. I can show you there's a Pfizer and a, and a Moderna vial, empty. Um, uh, that, uh, so they did very well at getting that vaccine developed in record time. But what the problem was is they, they basically abdicated their response to the state health departments and really ignored a lot of the evidence that the state health departments were not going to be able to do this. And they, late in the Trump administration, they were saying, you can't expect us as a federal government to know where to set up vaccine clinics. It's almost the same rhetoric that they use with testing when they said, well, the states can do the testing. And I think this abdication of the federal response for this last mile of turning a vaccine into a vaccination, that really was something that they did not do. And the Biden administration, to their credit, recognized this and have been trying to do, trying to fix this problem, but it is a very hard problem with that, that you can't just turn around in one, one minute or one month. And it is something that's going to require a lot of innovative thinking and, and maybe moving outside of the government channels and talking to people from Silicon Valley like the Biden administration is doing to try and make this, this work better because it's, it's not working this last mile. And I think that that's, that's the biggest frustration when you see a state has this many doses on hand but have only administered that, that a certain number or a certain percentage of that, that tells you that they're unable to, un unable to perform. And that's where we really have to, to focus is just turning these vaccines into vaccinations. And it, it's, I don't, I think it's slowly going to get better, but it's going to take some time before we get the pace up. And maybe it will be when the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is around, because that's something that is a little bit easier to give. And we can talk about that. But with these current vaccines, these two dose regimens in the cold chain, it's just something that's made it much more logistically challenging than I think the states are prepared to handle, even though most of it was predictable. And I think we, we just don't have the infrastructure to do it any faster, but we have to. You mentioned uh, innovation. I, I read an, an interesting story that I think is symptomatic of the, the way the system is so fragmented. Uh, it, it concerns uh, a computer program in New York who is trying to get a relative vaccinated. And what he did, discovered is that there's so many websites you have to go to and register. So he aggregated several counties worth of information with a script and in, in a week and $50 worth of expenses, he set up a system that then tweets out appointments as they become available. And I, I know people who've used this. So, I mean, it seems like there's so much opportunity here to, to solve this problem with, with new thinking. D definitely. And I think right now we have a whole group of people who are becoming kind of uh, vaccine hunters that are helping elderly people get vaccines and they made it their, their job. And it didn't need to be that way. And it's just that these health departments don't have much IT resources. So they're just using the old systems that they've always used and just kind of going at whatever pace that they, they can handle and not even looking outside of that, outside of that, because it's something that they're just kind of doing by default. And I do think in general, states need to start engaging these developers to try. And it needs to be like open table when you have a restaurant reservation, when there's something open that you get a text message and go. And you can't expect an 85 year old person to have six windows open, continuing to refresh as if they're looking for Madonna tickets. And that's basically what's happened is that it's become this uh, whole, th this whole uh, bureaucratic process to get a vaccine appointment. And it's only going to get harder if, when we move to the general population, when we have more. So we've got to get this streamlined. And eventually it should just be, you should be able to walk up and get your vaccine the way you do for a flu, a flu vaccine clinic. It's just that there's a scarcity right now. But I do think that these, these systems that these $50 uh, tweets, that works. I think that we have to find some way to scale it. And you have that, that, that technology solution on the one hand, and then you have kind of a very low-tech approach in states like West Virginia, where they basically just assumed the federal government was going to forget them because the federal government often forgets West Virginia. So they just started moving as if they weren't going to get support. And they just did it kind of uh, with, with kind of with grit, basically just said, let's get our local pharmacies ready. They know the community. They're just going to go out and do this. And we're going to not leave any vaccine on the, on the shelf. We're just going to do it. So there's two ways to do it. Either just do it the old fashioned way or, or use these high, high, high tech tools. But, a lot of places didn't do that. And we have this very disjointed process. And I think it's really uh, exposing how incompetent 
uh, many of the many of the government functions are when it, when it comes to a vaccine distribution process. And again, it's just another example of this being kind of a failure of government. It's just not. It's to me mind boggling that everybody in this field can tell people exactly what needs to be done and what's going to happen if you don't do it, but then they don't, they still don't do it. And then, then it becomes a story that they, they throw their hands up. Well, we didn't know, but I, of course you knew. So I, I really don't, uh, it, to me, it's, it, it's been eye-opening to me to see these same mistakes being made over and over again and repeated over and over again. I want to ask you about a story that seems like there should be a lot that we can learn from it. So I read that you know, one of the countries that has had the highest rate of vaccination is Israel. It's leading the world in uh, uh, getting the vaccine into people's arms. Are there things that can be learned from that, that other countries can emulate? How much of it is just specific to that context? What, what are you seeing there? A lot of it has to do with Israel having a very strong primary care network and a, and a public health infrastructure that they can push things out very quickly, that they're ready to go. And in, in the United States is very fragmented. So I'm sitting here in Pittsburgh, we have a county health department here, but the, the next county, the next counties over do not, they're run by the state health department. So all of that makes it a little bit more different when you're trying to push something out. But what Israel did is started to use mass vaccination, moving people through very quickly, and they didn't allow priority groups to become kind of an obstacle. So we can talk a little bit more about the priority groups, but they were made with a purpose in mind to decrease the impact of the virus, to protect the vulnerable populations that were compromising hospital capacity, because that's what this whole pandemic response has really been about, is trying to, to keep the, the curve flat, flatten the curve to keep it underneath hospital capacity. But because of that, you had places that, that were just being very cautious about who they were vaccinating because they did not want to deviate from the priority groups. It became dogma. Even when the CDC was saying, do not leave vaccine on the, on the shelves, vaccinate anybody, just put it in someone's arm if you're in those situations. The Surgeon General uh, during the last administration tweeted that multiple times. But then you had the state governor saying, don't do it. If you, if you God forbid, vaccinate a 1B or, 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 or a 1C before a 1A, I'm going to take your license and I'm going to fine you. Uh, so what what so that was kind of the state bureaucracies favoring vaccine in the trash can versus in people's arms. And I think that's constrained some of the early days of this this um, early days of the rollout. Even these Pfizer vials, they had to get special permission to get a six dose out of them. And then the government sends you the package and it gives you a, a needle that doesn't isn't able to take the six dose out of it in some situ situations. So there's a lot of this kind of kind of Keystone Cops type of blundering things that, that have that have happened, but uh, it's it's really just cascading uh, cascading failures. And I think that the U.S. I think it's embarrassing that we were the the first to develop these vaccines, really push forward these vaccines, but we can't actually turn them into vaccinations. And I think we let a lot of the bureaucracy get in the way of actually the final end goal, which is getting people vaccinated. So say more about the the tiers of who gets vaccinated and and the sort. Of, um ranking by, by, I think it's elderly and then various conditions and so forth. So what do you think of that? How would you, this is a question that's come in as we were talking. What do you think of that? How would you want to reshape that if you had the option? So I, I do think the priority groups were set properly because they were based on who is at most risk for getting serious consequences from COVID-19, who's most likely to be hospitalized, who's most likely to die, and who's most likely to be exposed, healthcare workers. So phase 1A was healthcare workers and those above the age of 75. That, that's really, uh, nursing home, sorry, nursing home residents. So if you look at our, our epidemiology, maybe at some at sometimes maybe 60% of our deaths in some states were related to nursing homes and they continued to be a major driver of hospitalization. So nursing home patients and, and uh, doctors and nurses and other people that worked in the health fields in hospitals, they were phase 1A. And then phase 1B were other essential workers defined by states and it differed uh, according to states and then people 75 and above. And you have to remember that the vaccine isn't designed to make COVID go away. COVID is not going anywhere. This is going to become a respiratory virus the vac that, that we deal with every year. The vaccine is designed to defang this virus, to tame it, so that it's never able to cause serious disease, hospitalization, or death at the rate that it does now, so that it ceases to be a public health emergency. So that's what the vaccination program was done for. It was not to decrease spread. It was to decrease the damage that the virus was causing. But what happened, and I think... I think that I, I agree with the priority grouping, but I did not want it to become dogma that people say, okay, somebody, somebody has extra doses left over. How are we going to vaccinate people that are not in the priority group that we're doing? 
So I think it was important. And the CDC was very quick to put that flexibility saying, just put it in anybody or let's just do 65, uh, 65 and above. Let's just make this much more flexible so vaccinators can make these decisions on the fly and don't have to worry about it. But, but what ended up happening is the states put lots of restrictions in contravene, uh, kind of contravening what the federal government was giving people permission to do or saying, this is what you should be doing. And that's made the priority groups an obstacle to getting vaccines into people's arms. I don't think that it would make sense if we're trying to end the, the pandemic and end the restrictions and end all of that, it wouldn't make sense to just kind of vaccinate at random. You're trying to use a scarce resource and, and, and end the pandemic and what, what's driving what, what's driving many of these restrictions, what's driving, what's driving deaths, what's driving hospitalization. So that's why the priority groups are set the way they are. But I don't think they should be thought of as 10 commandments. And I think what governors like Governor Cuomo did is completely, completely baffling to me. Or even what happened in Houston and Harris County, where that doctor had extra doses and vaccinated people and, and got fired uh, and got charged by the by the attorney, uh, the district attorney there for, for stealing uh, because there was nothing to do with that they, because of the, the vaccine doses that he went outside the priority group because they were going to get wasted. I think this has gone a little bit too much and a little bit crazy. So I want to talk about one of the factors that is potentially going to set, set us back. So the, the, the emergence of these new variants. Uh, and so I guess two questions. One is how much is known about the, the uh, I think the British one is the more lethal one or is thought to be more lethal, more transmissible. How much is known so far uh, in terms of how, how rigorous is our understanding of that? So it's important to remember that this virus has been throwing off variants since it first appeared in humans. And most variants don't make headlines because they don't change the function of the virus. But there are several variants that seem to have given the virus new capacity. So we'll start with the UK variant, which is also known as B117. So this variant has a cluster of mutations that affect the what's called the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So the way the virus gets into your cells. And it appeared in the UK in September, and it came, became quickly the dominant version of the virus. It outcompeted the natural version, which tells you, that gives you a hint that this might be more transmissible. And they looked at it in the lab, and they've done studies showing that it likely is 30 to 50% more transmissible than the original variant. Whether or not it's more lethal is still an open question. There is some data, the UK government is, 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 has produced some data, but it hasn't been peer reviewed. We haven't seen all of it. That shows that it perhaps maybe is more, more, um, more dangerous to have this version than another version, but it still spreads the same way. It's still respiratory droplets and the same common sense measures of washing your hands, uh, wearing face coverings and avoiding crowded and congregated places stops it. And when you look at the, the UK variant, versus our vaccines. Our vaccines do take care of it. So the, the solution to this UK variant is to get vaccine into people's arms faster. It's basically a race. The UK variant by simple Darwinian principles is going to outcompete the original version and it will likely become the dominant strain that we see in any country where it, where it appears. But we have, the, we have a solution at hand and it's the vaccine and this really underscores the need the other, to, to get vaccine into people's arms. The other variants that are of concern are the South African version and, uh, and the Brazilian version. So they have other little numbers, names, number names as well, 157 and, and P1. Those variants, it does appear, cause a little bit of trouble for some of our vaccines, that they're not as efficacious, meaning that maybe 50% of cases are, are, are blocked by the, virus, by, the, by the vaccine. But what's important when you look even at the South African variant, variant or the Brazilian variant is that our vaccines, although they may not be able to stop you from getting symptomatic infection, our vaccines still block or still do what, they, what they're designed to do, prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death. So I think that's another important thing to know about these variants. But they, they are a little bit of a wild card. And I think uh, it's, it's a little bit early to see exactly what's gonna, what their trajectory is going to be in the United States. But we have the solution in hand, and it's getting vaccine into people's arms. So in terms of understanding the spread of a new variant and, and its, its characteristics, is, I understand that is, that's done by sequencing its DNA to see how it compares with the previous or other kinds of uh, uh, previous uh, strains. So how much of that kind of detection or, or surveillance is actually being done in the United States right now? Not very much. They've increased it. So it's, it's not that every case gets sequenced or not even 
not even the majority, it's a, a small minority, maybe 10% or less are getting that sequencing and it's RNA for coronavirus, not DNA, but the RNA gets sequenced only in basically, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So when you hear in your town, a new variant case discovered, that's usually just the first reported case. There's clearly more out there. Uh, we know it's there. It's probably the, the UK variant It's probably about 10% of our cases from the last modeling study that I've seen. So it is out there. We don't do enough of it. And it's not surprising that the UK variant had been found in places like the UK, which do a lot better surveillance or South Africa, which does a lot better surveillance, or Denmark, which does, th those are kind of the paragons of, of this type of surveillance. This is going to be something we see increasing because it's going to be important to track the evolution. If we need to update vaccines, I don't know if, that, if, if that's going to happen or not, but that's the only way we're going to know is by looking at this. And if you're a contact tracer and you've got 15 cases to go over today, if you know one of them is caused by the variant, you want that information because you're going to prioritize that person first and say, let's go after that person's contacts first because they're more likely to have spread it because they have a more contagious version. So it is essential public health information. And again, another failure that we've seen that we don't have that capacity uh, built out in the United States as they do in other countries. You mentioned updating the, the vaccine. So what would that look like? So suppose in six months, we just, it's discovered, yes, it's, it's essential to go back and, and update them. Would the manufacturer, the, the drug makers then have to go through a new set of trials and a and, and new sort of development cycle? Not completely. So the good thing about the vaccines that we're using now are that they're using what are called vaccine platforms, which allows them kind of to plug and play and switch and update much easier than a traditional vaccine. So that part, the technical part is, is, is much easier and companies are already starting to do that, uh, at least in the early stages. It's unclear what the regulatory agencies would do. Likely, it would be a very perfunctory approval saying, okay, you, you've just changed, you just made a strain change. We're not going to, we're comfortable with the technology. We've already approved it. We've seen it. There's no reason biologically that it would have a major issue. They may have to do some safety, a, a small phase one safety type of study. I could imagine the, that being the max, but the whole value, one of the things that people have been pushing with vaccine platforms is to get regulatory agencies to think about the platform and then a strain change or an update or a new candidate, not requiring the full, the, the full phase one, phase two, phase three data to be to be submitted. And I think it makes sense uh, because, because of the way the technology works that you could do that. It's a question whether or not it will happen. I do think in the midst of a pandemic, if there is a need for a strain change, I think it would be ushered in very quickly by the regulatory agencies because they're comfortable with, with the, the technologies that were used for the original vaccines. So I want to talk more about how the vaccines are developed and tested because I think that there's still a lot of confusion and, and concern around that. Um, so one thing I read is that the trials for children are starting up or are underway already. Why is that done separately from adult tests? What's the, what's the reasoning for that? Well, children are not little adults, as pediatricians will always tell you, that there are unique physiological issues in children. Uh, and then you have to remember, so every vaccine is a risk-benefit calculation you have to make. What is the risk of the, the disease and what is the risk of the vaccine? And that's different, especially for a disease like COVID-19, where we see this basically linear increase in severity as you get older. So if you're a nine-year-old, is it worth it to get vaccinated against this? And is the risk benefit ratio different for you and, and what you're willing to tolerate as a nine-year-old or what your parents are willing to let you tolerate versus a 90-year-old? So th that's why you wanna do trials because there's gonna be a different calculation because you have to always weigh the benefit of the vaccine against the risk of disease. And if the risk of disease is very low in a child, a nine-year-old, because they're not likely to get severe disease, hospitalization or death, does it justify getting the vaccine and having side effects, having to take a day off from school? All of that, you have to think about that whole, that, that whole spectrum. And you have to see, is there other side effects that are occurring in this age group that don't? So for certain vaccines, we don't vaccinate below a certain age because they cause more, they cause more problems. And so you have to actually study it differently because the physiology is a little bit different and the risk benefit calculation is different. And it may be that when we have a pediatric vaccine, it might be one of the, it may be totally different. It may not be the Pfizer, Moderna. It might be something down the line that's in the back of the pack that you're not hearing about that's more tolerable and easier to give to children or, or better. So that's that's why it's different. The same thing is with, with pregnant women. Those are usually separate trials as well, because there's differences in physiology and a different risk benefit calculation. So that brings me to the topic that I wanted to ask you again about. We've talked before. So there's an ongoing debate about reopening schools. Some states are completely virtual. Some states are hybrid. It's a real uh, patchwork. And the, the CDC has come out with new guidelines 
And there's, again, they, they sort of renew the debate. It, one of the things I understand about the guidelines is that they are keyed to community levels of spread, um, not specific to the school. So how do you help us understand what that means and, and how do you think about that in terms of evaluating whether a school area or, or a particular school should reopen? So that's one of the more baffling parts of the guidance. The CDC guidance is very robust and the CDC director has been unequivocal uh, during this about, about schools being a priority to reopen. Uh, and, and the CDC themselves have published data showing that in places where there was high community spread, schools were one of the safest places to be, that it wasn't impacted. If the school was able to do social distancing, face covering policies uh, and, and limit some of the class sizes, they were able to not be impinged upon so much by the community. So a lot of us in the field don't understand why the CDC put that in there uh, that way. And, and I think this is just, I, I think there, that it's, to me, looking at the science, schools, especially eighth grade and below, I think can be open in person with some mitigation measures, face coverings, de decreased class size, probably not so much with the extracurricular activities um, because that's what was driving spread when people were able to go going, going to sports or going to clandestine homecoming dances. That's what was driving cases. So I do think you can do this. The CDC guidance I think is, is good. It's what, the, it's what people needed. That one part that, about the community prevalence, a lot of us are, are really not understanding why that happened. And I think this debate is gonna continue for some time. I mean, the science is on the side of those of us who want to open schools for in-person learning, not only because of COVID risks, but also all of the ancillary problems that are happening with having schools closed, where you're making, where this is uh, creating psychosocial problems for many of these children that are doing virtual learning. They're not actually being able to virtually learn because it's not very effective. And you also see this being disproportionately um, impacting those individuals who are not that advantaged, that don't have resources, that have maybe a, a single parent household or don't have, a, a, don't have someone that can sit with them to do all the computer work during that. So I do think that this, this debate is gonna continue and it's, getting, it's, it's becoming sort of an infight between, uh, the, by, between the union teacher, the, the teachers unions as well as uh, big city, um, big city um, politicians, for example, in Chicago and San Francisco, and it's going to, to play out for some time. And I think, again, this is another area where politics injected itself into what should have really been a scientifically based decision. So I wanna bring in some of the questions we're, we've got from the audience. So thanks to all of you watching and for your questions, we'll try to get in as many as we can. So this one concerns the Russian Sputnik V vaccine that was uh, the results for which were published recently um, I think it's 80%, 90% effective according to this question. Do you have a view of this uh, vaccine? Do you think it would be wise to, would you recommend that it be purchased for use in the United States? What, what's your trust level on this in terms of science? I can, I admit that early on when, when the Russian head of state had said that they had a vaccine and that they were going to use it, a vaccine he himself has not been injected with, but um, that, that I was very skeptical because they started it before we had seen phase three clinical data. They did get phase three clinical data published in The Lancet, which is a major medical journal, and it looks good, it looks robust. Um, I, I do, in general, um, I haven't seen any safety signals and it's being used in other countries as well. I don't necessarily think that we, we're gonna see this come to the United States and be a vaccine that's used in the United States, because again, I, I think the FDA probably will not uh, accept that, that data. They'd want another trial in order to do it. And, I, and I, the general consensus is we, with Moderna and Pfizer, J&J, &J, Novavax and AstraZeneca, we'll have our menu and have everybody vaccinated. It's more a question of just getting production scaled up. I, it's interesting because Russia is going to probably use this as a tool of diplomacy to get other countries under their sphere of influence, just like China is doing with their vaccines as well. But I, I don't have any qualms against it now. Um, more data is always better. And I, I think now that we've saw the phase three data published in a, in a peer reviewed medical journal, a lot of the skepticism that we all, I think, initially had for good reason has, has sort of melted away. I want to ask a bit about um, the immunity people get after contracting COVID-19. So um, how robust is it? And if someone has had it and recovered, should they still pursue getting a vaccine? Is there, a, is there an upside? Is there a downside to doing that? In general, once you recover from COVID-19, it's extremely unlikely that you get a, re a reinfection within several months. Maybe a year down the line, you may be able to get a reinfection and it might be very, very mild. But what we're seeing 
in South, with the South African variant, with the Brazilian variant, is that people are getting reinfected. And that likely has to do with the mutations escaping natural immunity to some degree. And when you look at the people who got reinfected, they seem to get reinfected at a higher rate with natural immunity than they did with the in the vaccine trials in South Africa and Brazil. So it appears that the vaccine does provide you more robust immunity than natural infection when it comes to those variants. And that we do recommend people who have been infected get the vaccine. Uh, and I think it will increase your immunity, make it last longer, make it more durable. We may eventually get to a point where with these two dose vaccines, if you've, if you've had a documented infection, we only need to give you one dose. That data is starting to trickle out and it looks pretty good so far. So if you have another few minutes, I just want to get through another couple of topics. Is that good for you? Yeah, I can keep going. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to talk about where we are in, in the pandemic and, you know, the, the, there's, there are signs of things that we should be optimistic about. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I saw is that the number of hospitalizations is down, uh, the number of new cases is down relative to January. So I wanted to understand January was a very high peak um, in, in looking at the graph, what was going on in, 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 is there some anomaly that we're just not seeing in, in the data or is it really, is it going in the right direction right now? It is going in the right direction. And all of us were very cautious when that data first started coming out because we, did, we didn't know if it was an aberration or if it was going to be a sustained decrease. And it's actually multiple indicators, as you said, cases, hospitalizations and death all going down, as well as the percent positivity going down because testing has went down a little bit. So you've got to look at the percent positivity. All of those things are trending in the right direction. And it's likely multifactorial. One is that travel has, has gotten down to more of a baseline after Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year. So we don't see all that mixing going on. People are getting better. They're finally starting to think about the fact that we live in a pandemic. So they're getting better at wearing face coverings and washing their hands and trying to avoid some of the, the more um, dangerous situations where there's likely to be spread. And we have a lot of people that got infected. Probably 30% of the population has been infected and that makes it harder. It's not anywhere near herd immunity. However, a virus is gonna find it less hospitable when you've got 30% of the population that has prior infection versus having 5%. So that's also playing a role. And we've had enough vaccine, we've had a little bit of vaccine rollout, so we're probably seeing some minor effect as the vaccine as well. The question still remains, is this sustainable? Many of us are worried because of the UK variants appearance here, whether or not this will, this will tick back up. Hopefully it doesn't because we'll get enough vaccine into people's arms, but you know, there's a real risk. And I still look at hospitalization numbers as the most important figure. And, and as long as that looks good, I, I'm, 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 I feel good about things. I got a little bit, it got a little bit scary in, in November and December when we were seeing hospitals go back into crisis again. But right now things are looking a lot better. But remember, we're still very high. We're, we're not like we were in the summer. We're, not, we're, we're still got a very high number of people that are in the hospital in the tens of thousands. We still have tens of thousands of cases occurring every day and over a thousand deaths per day. So we're still not, it, we're still at a very high level. If it's, uh, I've seen the former CDC director talk about it as a floodwater receding. It's still, it's receding, but it is still very high. So a couple of questions about the, back to the vaccines. Um, how much is known about the uh, how long you have protection once you've been vaccinated is, is is there enough data yet to establish that not yet we have to do what are called natural history studies so we follow people who've been vaccinated and watch them to see do they get reinfected what happens to their antibody levels what happens to their t-cell levels it's likely going to be on the order of you know a year or more but it's too early to say exactly when that might be and if there's going to be a need for a booster yeah, so so you're so I was just that was my next question. So it might be that we need to go back and get re uh, another vaccine or like the flu shot. It's an annual cycle. Yeah, but the flu shot's not a booster. The flu shot's a strain change. So there's two different yeah. concepts. One is boosting your immunity, the way you get a tetanus shot every ten years, or you get an MMR, a measles, mumps, rubella at twelve and fifteen months, and then another one at five years. So that's a booster. So all of that is still unclear. Even the strain change is unclear right now. I think it's been too, it's, it's, we're too early on to know exactly how that all is going to turn out. And do we know if someone who has been vaccinated can, uh, they're protected, but are they still able to transmit the, the virus to someone else? So this is a very controversial question and it's kind of splitting our field. Most of us believe, and I'm on the side of the biology shows that a vaccine that's this highly effective, 95% at preventing symptomatic disease is going to decrease transmission. We're starting to see data from Israel that this is the case. Uh, it's too hard to exactly, it's, it's still not enough evidence for public health 
for public health agencies to change their recommendations. So right now, I think the risk is very low that someone who's been vaccinated with two doses and has waited two weeks is going to be an asymptomatic spreader of the infection. But we're waiting for more data to say that. And the CDC did change its guidance. So if you've gotten two doses of your vaccine and you waited two weeks and you get exposed, you don't have to re-quarantine. So I think we're going to get there. It's just taking some time for all that data and for people to be comfortable uh, to say that. But if you've got two vaccinated people that are on the same timeline, they, they, there's no risk there. It's just a question about uh, whether when you're around somebody that's not been vaccinated, what you need to do. And I think what we will get to that point, and I think most people believe that it's gonna be the case. We're just waiting for more data to come in to be able to say that definitively and change guidance. You mentioned that testing is down as well. And that seems odd to me. I would have thought that testing should be going up as well, just so that there's more monitoring. What's your thought on that? Uh, yeah, re remember, we talked about this earlier that it's those state health departments that are doing vaccinations and they also do testing and they don't have they can't do both. Uh, they don't have enough people to do that. So they're they're taking people from the testing sites and, and putting them into the into vaccinations. Uh, so that so that's another constraint that we have. So, yes, testing has gone on, even though we've got home tests available now. Testing's ha testing has gone down. And I think it's we don't want it to go down. The, the more testing we do, the more we know, and the, the more easier people can make decisions about their lives. And I think, again, this is still going to be a problem with, with testing probably for the next several several months until we get more of the population vaccinated. And, and again, it's another inexcusable problem that we've still been facing since, um, since the beginning of this pandemic. So a couple more questions just about what the future holds and what it might look like. So one of the questions that has come in, and I'm interested in this as well, um, as more people get vaccinated, more things will be, they'll be able to do more things. Presumably restaurants will be able to say, if you've been vaccinated, you can come in, you know, we'll take more people, things like that, or, or sporting events. What's, how will there, how is it going to be possible to know if someone's been vaccinated? Why, why, can, why can't I just print out a piece of paper and say, here's my vaccination thing. And, or, you know, I take a picture of you from Twitter and copy, you know, forge your vaccination card or something like that how are we going to get around that kind of problem? So the, the vaccine cards that you get are very flimsy and you could just print them off. They're more reminders to come back for your second dose than anything or things that you can post on the internet and look cool that you've gotten your vaccine rather than some kind of ironclad type of thing. But actually the, the same thing is true for the yellow fever vaccine card, which you need to get, go to, if you go from the United States to Peru, Peru will ask you for your yellow fever vaccine card. And it's just this yellow piece of paper. So we, I think, but I think there is going to be a need to make this more secure some way, if that's going to be a way to enter I, I really am skeptical of the fact that it's going to happen like when you go to Pizza Hut that they ask you if you're vaccinated before you sit down. I think it's more likely going to be I'm going on a Carnival Cruise Line cruise. They're going to want to look at documentation or if you're go doing international travel that they may want documentation to avoid a 14 day quarantine or a test. And I think that there are companies that are working, um, IATA, which is one of those travel travel groups, they're working on some kind of app that could be linked to your, maybe to your TSA pre-check or something like that for those people who have it, that you can, you can show that vaccine, uh, that you're va vaccinated. But remember, this is going to be temporary though. This isn't going to be forever. As soon as we get enough people vaccinated, as soon as we're not worried about this anymore, uh, about hospital capacity, I think that those are all going to melt away except for maybe in some countries where they may be lagging and getting their vaccines up and, and maybe some of the island nations like New Zealand where they're going to be very aggressive with people coming in, but it will melt away. Sometimes people think this is gonna be the new normal. Um, I don't think it will be. I think it will be a temporary uh, issue that happens. And, and, it's always, and people think it's, you know, that, that it's infringing on their right to travel, but I think it's not necessarily anything different than the yellow fever vaccine. And it doesn't mean you can't go into another country. It just means take a test when you come into the country, which I think we should be doing Anyway, I think we should be screening people at the gates, even for domestic airlines, with just with the rapid test, just to be able to decrease the transmission. Let me just acknowledge, thanks to those of you on the super chat for your contributions and supporting our, our broadcast today. Um, final question for you. We hear a lot about herd immunity, and I, I've heard that it's, you know, one estimated 70 to 90 percent of the population needs to have immunity for us to get to that point. It, one, do you think that's do you agree with that assessment? And two, can you get there if with the two dose vaccines, only if only 70 to 90 percent have gotten just the first dose, will we get to herd immunity faster? Or, do you, or does it mean both doses have to be in place? So uh, I think, you know, the numbers are probably 70 to 90 percent for herd immunity, but I don't think that's the 
I think that we're going to see benefits even prior to that, because once you get your vulnerable populations vaccinated, then you have pressure lifting off of hospitals. And that 70 to 90 also assumes that the population is homogenous, that everybody has an equal risk of getting infected and spreading the disease. And that's not true because our population is very heterogeneous and it kind of follows this 80-20 rule that 80% 80 of infections are caused by 20% of people. Just think of typhoid Mary. So if you can get your, your spreaders vaccinated, you'll start to see those benefits. And it is true for the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, which are in the AstraZeneca vaccine, Novavax vaccine, those are all two dose vaccines that you would not have robust immunity unless you had both of those doses in. You get some protection after the single dose, but we don't know how long it is and it's not as durable or as effective as a, as a two dose regimen uh, for those vaccines. But I think that we'll probably move away from thinking about, I think herd immunity is gonna be an important benchmark, but I think it's not going to be the trigger for when things get back to normal is what people say. I think really what's going to get back to normal is when people are not dying and hospitals are not in crisis. So are you hopeful that uh, the summer might be a turning point or the back to school season, or we're going to wait till sort of the winter holidays? I, I think in summer we'll be in a better shape. I think that most people by that time, I think that a lot of people have been vaccinated. Our vulnerable populations will be vaccinated. The hospitals will saying, we're okay. We're doing fine. We have enough personal protective equipment. We're not we aren't worried about ICU beds. And I think that's going to change the general outlook because I think in some ways, even though it doesn't seem like it, a lot of this has been tied to hospital capacity from the very beginning. And if you look at hospital capacity, that's really the way we gauge how, 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 what types of, of restrictions you're going to see public health uh, officials put in place. Well, Amisha, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. And thanks for all the work you're doing. I appreciate you coming and joining us. Thank you. And to all of you watching, if you enjoy this program, please uh, like what you uh, like us on YouTube. Leave a comment. We'd like to see what you have to say. And uh, if you are watching on Facebook or Twitter, please like and share uh, this video so we can reach larger audiences. And if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at newideal at einran.org.